organizing International Science Film Festival of India from 22nd to 25th of December. And due to the pandemic, we are doing it on virtual mode this uh, year. And we had a number of master classes and uh, webinars for you uh, scheduled here. Uh, as you know, uh, uh, that today's uh, the, the first master class is on new trends in science filmmaking. And uh, we are delighted that we have we are having Mr. A. G. Van Dilla, a science filmmaker from Amsterdam, Netherlands, with us. And uh, uh, as you know, uh, Andreas, uh, Mr. Van Dilla, uh, was born in Amsterdam, Netherlands, and currently living in Delhi, India. Uh, coming from a culturally oriented family, he loves traveling and exploring new parts of the world. Being very passionate about art and science. He has spent most of his time traveling, meeting new people and working on projects like music videos, commercials, photography and films. He has been uh, making videos since the age of 19. Uh, he wanted to study films and was ex uh, um, accepted at the European Film College in, uh, in Denmark, where he studies filmmaking for a year, getting lectures by some of uh, the great heroes like uh, Mr. Thomas Wintenberg and John Harlan. After his wonderful experience, he started internship uh, at a wet film and work on various prize winning commercials and films in Netherlands uh, for different production houses from 2012 to 2015. He also wrote history by creating a group photo portrait of, of all Dutch hip hop artists in 2013. Currently, he is working on his first feature documentary, Made in India, exploring Jugar and uh, frugal improved uh, innovations in India. So, uh, uh, a very warm welcome to you, uh, Vandela. Uh, I must say, uh, a very long journey from uh, music video and commercials to the science film. So, how do you feel your journey here? Yeah, it's definitely been a very... Uh very rich journey um and i'm definitely in a different space now than i was let's say uh five ten years ago um not only by you know physical location like i'm really in a different country and i have a very different life now but also um that i kind of decided to develop my own uh taste and style of filmmaking, um, which in Amsterdam was, um, yeah, not the case at that time. I was mostly participating to other people's uh, vision. And now I have been for the past few years developing my own uh, vision as an uh, independent uh, filmmaker. And science is a, is a big part of that. But uh, in the future, humanities will also be uh, pretty much uh, entrenched into the topics of my films. Um, <clears throat> I hope that everyone can hear me well. Uh, yeah, we are hearing you uh, loud and clear. Okay, that's great. Then I'll just give, um, give kind of an introduction of what I've been doing uh, in India for the past mm -hmm. few years um, and how that journey came to be. So um, I decided to uh, come to India on a normal backpacking trip. Um, I was uh, basically uh, working a lot in the Netherlands and I wanted a bit more than just a two week beach vacation. So I was kind of in doubt uh, about uh, going to Thailand for two weeks or doing something more uh, substantial, which was like, you know, doing maybe like a Vipassana or like a spiritual journey mm -hmm. and, you know, really, uh, really uh, relax and unwind in a different way. Mm -hmm. And um, at that time, my uh, career coach was very much um, uh, involved in India from, uh, from her student times. And uh, she recommended me to go to... Um, yeah, the north of India at that time. It was like, you know, early April, May. So then season time would start there. And, uh, and uh, she said, yeah, that's perfect 
uh, for now. So I decided to book India and not knowing that it would uh, change my life uh, forever <laughs> in a point of no return type of way. Um, I landed in Delhi and um, yeah, I was just um, fascinated by India and not only fascinated by India as a country, but mostly about how things function in a country like India and how things uh, can improve and innovate in a country like India. Because uh, we in the West have heard a lot about India's growth story. And um, I thought that that would be quite a challenge uh, on that scale and how would that go? And I ran into a, a book called uh, Jugad Innovation at that time uh, in a mall in Delhi. And I'd had heard the word a bit here and there. And I thought like, okay, this might be that kind of um, Indian way of developing and innovating. And when I read that book, I decided to contact the author of the book because I wanted to um, turn the book into a film series. At that time, it was a feature length documentary. Um, and later I decided to turn it into a series because I touched on many different topics and I wanted to compartmentalize that a bit for the viewer. Um, but that book gave me a lot of insight into India's um, ground realities and India's um, diversity and therefore also different needs in different parts of the country. Um, so I knew that because at that time when I was, you know, doing research for the film, I was really looking for that next big thing in India that would change the country forever. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, you know, you have your geos or your ATMs uh, of, the, of the kind, but more physical innovations, you know, that really improve people's lives on a day to day. Um, those were very... Uh, specialized and very uh, geographically and contextually uh, based and I found that very interesting and um, therefore I decided to uh, change the topic of the of the film a bit towards how different sectors in India can innovate for different types of people and um, not knowing that um, a lot of the things that I mentioned in the documentary would actually become even more relevant than they already were at the time that I made it uh, post pandemic times. So uh, in a bit, I would like to uh, share, the, share a clip of uh, the first episode, which is about India's uh, big migration wave and uh, urban uh, development and the fact that um, the urban planner and urban innovator who I spoke to in that uh, episode, um, they, advocate, they advocate for rural urbanization. So these are people from Pune who are kind of, let's say the last of the metropolitan cities to you know, really follow in the footsteps of all the uh, mega cities in India who kind of discovered that there is a limit to how big cities can get and therefore it would be better to create the jobs and the facilities for these um, people outside of the cities, maybe where they're originally from, to not congest cities more and to, you know, um, put more pressure on them than is already there because we're not even talking about uh, being annoyed uh, by being in traffic on a day-to-day -day, but we're talking about like how much water is there how much um, um, availability of waste management is there so we're talking about very finite things that cannot just keep on growing and after the pandemic as many people moved back to their uh, hometowns, um, 
that became a big opportunity for India to rethink um, how uh, India can develop after this. So the fact that, um, you know, even in the United States, where uh, now more than a million people have left New York, uh, more than a million people have left Los Angeles also, um, it gives us a new way of thinking about where we want to live, how we want to live. And this is an example of that. Uh, you know, we are basically working from home right now. Um, and a lot of the things uh, are not location driven anymore. And I think that India should now look at what can we do to kind of divide the pressure of, you know, business and labor evenly over the geographical space that is India, instead of focusing it on basically two, three metro cities versus, you know, 25 in China, uh, which I don't think uh, are realistic for India at this time. I think, I think it's better to, um, to kind of um, give up the dream of um, what Amitabh Khan said, 500 uh, metropolitan cities in India before the year of 2030. I don't think that is, um, that is realistic. But I will now share uh, the screen of that episode and, uh, and then, you can, uh, then you can watch it and then we'll continue. Okay. Okay. Why would somebody leave a, a bigger space in a village, come and live in a slum with no guarantee of a job, right? And uh, then work the streets or, you know, uh, maybe do things that they would not have normally done because they're not trained, right? They're farmers, primarily. Uh, why are we not taking care of them in the villages? 300 million migrants will be flocking to Indian cities in the next decade. How can India integrate so many people in an urban environment while maintaining their quality of life? In 1.7, we take a look at India's growth and how India can develop and innovate for the largest population the world has ever seen. Right now, cities are a bus. You know, it's the new game thing. But sadly, I don't think like few Indian cities can absorb, and I'm calling it absorb. Uh, our prime minister called it Karibi Bachata. You know, like it, it's going to digest. Cities are going to digest uh, poverty, right? Uh, in some cases they might, but mostly they're not going to. They're going to make people poorer for it. Maybe not monetarily. Uh, but with their quality of life, yes. When you have masses of people migrating, you know, you have a mass identity of that one. And you have masses who are living in the city, there is a mass identity of that one. When the mass identity of the migrants is much higher, much higher number of people are there, I think that starts, you know, getting rid of the original identity of the city. India's Biggest challenge is this process of urbanization. Every minute, there are 30 Indians moving from urban areas to urban area. India requires by 2030 500 new cities of 1 million each. Uh, new urbanization is necessary. India has been a reluctant urbanizer. So cities are centers of growth. Cities are centers of dynamism, cities are centers of prosperity, cities are centers of uh, yeah. new 
So I think you're muted still. Yeah, yeah. So one, uh, before you uh, proceed further, uh, if our viewers want to watch your films, yes, uh, will you kind enough to give us the link? What is the link where they can go and watch your film? Yeah, so uh, initially it was distributed by uh, Amazon Prime in the US and the UK. And then I tried to get it uh, uh, to be distributed in India. Uh, mm -hmm. But that process is quite long for Amazon. And the channel that I uh, had a deal with, which is called uh, uh, Digital Next and uh, Digital In, I N. Um, had some trouble after the pandemic. Uh, so I decided to put it on YouTube last week because I had a lot of requests from people from India who wanted to watch it. Uh, I haven't been uh, promoting it yet or sharing it yet, but if you go to my YouTube channel, Andreas Vandelaar, uh, the first three episodes are now online and the fourth episode I will uh, upload it uh, next week but that channel has finally uh picked up and they got their uh, operations back on so you will also see it on uh this new indian channel which is called uh next digital um so it's now widely available <laughs> so mm -hmm. you can uh, you can all see it um, yeah, so I will request all these attendees and our viewers to whenever they uh, get the time, please go to the YouTube and, and go and watch Wendler's film there. Uh, yes. Yes, definitely. Uh, the YouTube channel has also the full interviews of the people that uh, I have uh, met and spoke to uh, for the project. So um, there's also a lot of, uh, you know, unseen footage of like the full interviews uh, uh Wendell, uh, one question like when you come uh, you visited delhi and then you came across this jugad thing so uh, what why you uh, decided to uh, make a film on this jugad thing and what what is your understanding by this jugad thing and does it give you a little idea about the scientific temper which is there in the general masses of india um yeah, well, first of all, um, I, I stopped liking the word Jugad as much, um, despite, uh, you know, using the book as an inspiration for the, um, for the film project. I'm more uh, identify with Frugal Innovation, which is the follow-up book by the same author. Uh, because Jugad has kind of negative uh, undertones in it. And as I, you know, live longer in India myself, I also see that, yes, um, Jugad is maybe not uh, the way uh, we should call it. And maybe Jugad is also the reason that some things are not really innovating because it's too short term. And the fact that Frugal innovation has actually long-term uh, effects and it's actually very smart and very uh, sustainable uh, sometimes. Um, I think that that is still that Jew God in the way that it is affordable, it is uh, very um, easy to use, uh, it's very durable, but it doesn't have that kind of shortcut um, um, you know, that shortcut undertone in it. So um, in that way, I would like to uh, step off that word a bit more. But yes, um, India is basically a, a birthplace of a lot of very smart, inventive uh, people. And it's also a very entrepreneurial country. And um, one of the things of... Uh, of the current prime minister, which is good, is that that entrepreneurial spirit is being honed more and is also being respected more. Um, I remember when the crisis hit in uh, in Europe, that um, you know a lot of uh, white collar jobs got lost and a lot of people became freelancers or entrepreneurs, and that transition was actually 
a very, a very difficult one. But in India, a lot of people are already freelancers. Actually, most people are freelancers. And to be an entrepreneur or a freelancer, you have to uh, invent yourself or your product in a way that people would be interested into buying it, whether it's an actual innovation or whether it's trying to warm up food in a remote place with a makeshift gas uh, 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 stove. And now there are also a lot of maker spaces uh, in India, one of which is uh, featured in the series, which is called Maker's Asylum, who have moved uh, from Bombay to Goa, which by itself is uh, an immediate uh, you know, kind of innovation by itself because it's a company that said like, do we need to be in Bombay where rents are super high? Um, or do we just move the whole place to a location which is more suitable for frugal innovations to actually be created? And therefore also make it accessible to uh, more people because uh, the fees and the... Um, um, and the lectures can be done online. <clears throat> so the fees can be lower and the lectures can be done online. And um, that kind of spirit is, uh, is definitely here in India. It's a, it's a very, uh, one of the main um, aspects of frugal innovation is that kind of adaptability um, as you go along with a project or with a business to just decide in one go to just close up shop, move it somewhere else and do the exact same thing of the same quality in that location, but make cater it to that exact place. And uh, I think for a country of the scale of India, it is, um, it is not wise to kind of fixate on a long-term goal and um, obsess about it in a way that you kind of um, remove all new um, trends or new realities that are coming up to fix that ideal uh, image of where the country should go. I think it should be a more as India develops, new things should be taken up fast and um, and as India goes along, it should develop more organically instead of like a fixed, um, a fixed image. And that's also how I approach the project. Um, so uh, now taking uh, your this clue, like as the things are growing, we are in, incorporating new things, new techniques. Uh, so when we talk about the filmmaking, uh, uh, you certainly are using uh, so many new innovative techniques and jigmos and things. So uh, in India, generally, we think that it's very difficult to make a film because you need uh, costly equipment and this and that and such a big, large crew. But now as the technology is improving and it's becoming, uh, I can say, democratization of the uh, the things uh, and the uh, and and the gizmos and everything which is helping uh, the new filmmakers to make a film so uh, all these uh, attendees which are here and which are listening us uh, what uh, like uh, how uh, please let us know what kind of techniques or in kind of gizmos and what kind of uh, handy equipment you are using to make films and and is it is it still difficult to make film or, or it is now easy? Anyone can make a film after having this mobile phone in, in, in the hand. Um, yeah, it depends on how you look at it. Um, so as I kind of uh, continue like on the tangent I was actually on, um, is that I came here with an ideal image of how a film should be made and it was actually a more romantic image which was very based on um you know the masters that i you know admired at the european film college you know who made really 
uh, really touching and beautiful, uh, you know, feature films or documentaries um, with a big budget. And that is the way it's supposed to be. And then fast forward to a 2000, um, yeah, 17, 18 reality and, um, you know, subsidies being very slow and also inaccessible for uh, independent filmmakers who don't want to follow, a, um, you know, an agenda of, of a government who, you know, all of a sudden wants to uh, uh, put a spotlight on certain topics that they like that I don't personally feel uh, interested in. I felt interested in, in the rise, rise and also importance of India as being, you know, one fifth of the world population. And um, I had to reinvent how I could still get that cinematic touch. So I did want a cinematic vibe to the film that, because that is really like where my passion lies. So I really wanted to have beautifully uh, neoclassical composed music. Um, but then I had to compromise on how I would shoot it because at some point as time went on after I arrived in India to make this film, um, you know, the pressure started mounting like, how will I do this? And at that time I had an iPhone 7 plus and I was, I had a phone steady cam and it was like, it felt like it wasn't good enough. But then that iPhone 7 Plus got stolen and I had to get a cheaper version. I had to get that iPhone SE phone, which is like that small iPhone because I didn't want to um, waste more of my savings because at that time I had to get started after a few months. And then the acceptance came that I can shoot it on the mobile phone. I have my appointments with the people that I want to uh, speak to and follow for the film. And yeah, this is uh, HD quality. Uh, the microphone is fine. Um, maybe next time I will invest in a microphone, but right now it's not required. And I will do the rest in the editing phase. And that's exactly what I did. So the iPhone 7 Plus, which is like higher quality and everything, even that I had to compromise on. And then as I went, I had to accept that it was going to be shot on an iPhone SE. And um, then as I went along, I uh, spoke to more people, got to know new things, which led me into new directions. So I very intuitively and organically developed this uh, story and project without fixating on where I wanted it to go. You know, of course it was a dream to, uh, to have it on an Amazon Prime or a Netflix. And, and, and I thought I had a fair shot, but I stopped, um, you know, focusing on that too much. And I started to be the project, which was a frugal filmmaker, you know, a frugal, uh, innovative filmmaker who, creates, you know, a project or a product, whatever you want to call it, um, from scratch with the tools in hand without, you know, wanting to overreach, you know, because it's also what they say about startups is that, um, you know, after, you know, the first or second uh, uh, investment rounds, it's all about scale. It's all about, you know, bringing it to the masses. And then a lot of these startups, they overreach, they have too much overhead and they collapse or they have to keep on uh, injecting uh, more money into the company that is not yet um, making profits and that's not yet really understanding the realities of bringing a product to such a big, uh, big scale. And in that sense, I was kind of like one of these <laughs> chai wallas who went to a place where chai was required or where people would buy chai and would just 
make that chai with the tools he had, whether that was a simple gas stove or whether that was a more spectacular gas stove. I did it um, uh, with a phone and myself as the engine of the of the product project without having to pay anyone else. And then at the end, I still, you know, delivered that quality that would make it as if it wasn't shot on a on a mobile phone. And uh, and yeah, with that, I'm very uh, very happy that I managed to actually do that in this way. So, uh, as you were talking about the managing the film, the way you managed, uh, uh, on the same line, I had a question from Aninda Kishore Das, uh, one of our attendees. He is asking, in science film, which kind of film is more important, story based or bare documentary, like the the fact? Um, bear documentary what does that mean like just documenting what just is just documentary uh, uh saying uh, w what it is as it is or making um uh, saying like a, a, a fiction film or or making a story around it so what do you think um i think that it really depends on the topic um i think that if you make a science film let's say about a scientist um, and it's more of a humanities-based approach to science, then it would be uh, more interesting to follow the emotional journey and the emotional story of a scientist's personal journey to um, undertaking whatever that person is undertaking. And in that sense, you would have to capture um, a process which is then happening with that person that as a beginning, middle, and an end. So for example, that person has, you know, um, high aspirations of bringing, uh, let's say a vaccine uh, to, uh, to people, then, then it would be nice to see that person uh, tackling the problem first, uh, finding challenges, tackling that problem, all the way to the vaccine being, uh, being uh, certified and ready to, um, you know, save a lot of lives. But what I did was more premise based. So the premise was, um, is it realistic that 300 million migrants will move to these already existing uh, metropolitan cities that are already uh, as big as they can get? And then I took the documentation of different people who specialize in that field and every quote I used to sustain and answer that premise question. Um, I think bear documentary is not to be uh, underestimated but if you want to kind of create a um, finite project so with you know a beginning and an end you have to have a premise or a story but bare documentary is what is actually um maybe even going to become the norm because as people are live streaming more uh this for example is also a bear documentary uh as people are posting instagram stories facebook stories uh going live that's all bare documentary. And depending on what you document, um, that value can be very high. You know, let's say uh, we had a farmer's march. If you are there documenting that farmer's march, there's no preparation or production involved, but you are um, documenting something of relevance in that moment that is happening at that moment. But science film, uh, is a specific niche and in my opinion um, and also obviously to the to the opinion of, um, of uh, Nimish and uh, people at uh, Digyan Prasa are trying to promote science film uh, I think it's more about the content and the story because people are attracted to stories and science which is viewed as something very complex, uh, something nerdy or maybe even boring, 
Um, if you want to overturn that kind of sentiment, then I think uh, a story and finding an interesting story within the science realm and casting uh, the people in that story really well. So finding the right person who um, has a certain charisma or has a certain uh, life or goal, which is uh, inspiring, uh, is more important than, uh, than just bare documenting. So it's for science, story-based is definitely the way to go in my opinion. Okay, so it means, yeah, bare uh, documentary is good, is trending, but when we talk about science, where the facts matters, the data matters, we have to have a story, uh, a story, uh, a fixed way to go. So now come, taking this point, like uh, generally uh, people uh, first find the story and then, and, and then research it and then go and make a film uh, and edit it. Uh, but uh, how do you uh, uh, conceive a project and how do you implement? What is your process? What are the steps you are taking to making a documentary? Do you try to uh, find a subject first and then research a lot and then finalize everything and then go for shooting or you uh, like how you do well at the beginning of this year um another topic for my next project uh, found me more than anything else and i think a part of that is to um keep on moving keep on meeting new people keep on talking about uh new trends or talking about what someone else is doing or what's happening here, what's happening there. Because in that way, um, the story comes to you more than that. Again, what I try to say that you fixate on uh, an idea. So after, um, after the festival round, I went down to Bangalore to uh, start you know, orienting for a new project. And at that time, I wanted to make a film uh, about ISRO, about the moon uh, journey. It's a fixated idea. It's an ambitious idea. ISRO is very complicated, uh, bureaucratic environment. Would they allow uh, documentary filmmakers to just, you know, walk in and out of that place? So it was kind of a let's see if that will happen type of documentary. And as I was in Bangalore, a friend of mine uh, called me over to have a cup of coffee. And he basically uh, uh, gave me a new idea of a film, which I then started researching after he gave it to me. Uh, I'm, not going to, uh, uh, <laughs> I'm not going to give that idea uh, away. No problem, no problem. Yeah. We just want to know the process you... Uh, uh, use the process yes. you apply in your filming so as he explained to me about that idea it resonated with me because uh, um, because both my father and my mother were uh, working in humanities my mother was an anthropologist and my father was a social worker and this topic was really about rehabilitating people into society and that's what my father was doing and I learned a lot from him about that topic as I was growing up. And um, I knew that there was a, there was a potential for people uh, to, who, with all odds against them, would still be able to make uh, the, the needed adjustments to function in society in a fruitful way, no matter what they had experienced growing up. And I still wanted to maybe do the ISRO and space, uh, uh, space based film at that time. But I felt that this was closer to my heart and it interested me more. And then, you know, it just goes automatically from there. So you come across an idea, it resonates with you. And then pretty much automatically you start picking up the phone, you start 
um, sending emails, you start reading uh, academic research on the topic, you start looking it up. And for this project, uh, I wanted it to be um, not shot with a phone. So what I did was I got a Ronin, which is like a steady cam for a DSLR. I got a really nice lens, which has a very, uh, very amazing uh, depth of field and also ama amazing dynamic range. So that I could again shoot it by myself with tools that would accommodate uh, just one person. Because on a normal film shoot, you actually need a focus puller on a lens, like a camera assistant. Um, and um, I don't prefer working with too many people. I prefer to keep it very organic and almost be invisible uh, uh, as I shoot. Um, so I just lifted the quality up with one step, you know, very small attainable step. Um, and I um, took the criticism from my previous project <clears throat> and took it along with me during the preparations for this project, which I will be starting on next year after the things, uh, after the dust uh, settles a bit more. Uh, and I will make a more story, human driven film, um, which, um, which is more interesting and, uh, and um, more engaging for more people because this is a very intellectual documentary, for example. Okay, so it, it won't be a fiction film, but it will be a people driven documentary film. Yeah, yeah, it will be about uh, people on the fringes of society who try to regain uh, their confidence to be able to uh, get back into that uh, society. Yeah. Uh, coming back to the science films again, like uh, what we have seen uh, in the International Science Film Festival of India, which where we are screening more than 211 films from 32 different countries, like we, uh, we had received a number of uh, science fiction movies also. So we had uh, uh, documentary films, short and, and long, up to 35 minutes, and then we have science fictions. So uh, we had a question from Dr. Arvind Raja, a teacher from Pondicherry. Uh, so he wanted to ask what makes a good science fiction movie. But I had extended the uh, question to what makes a good science fiction, whether it's a movie or it's a documentary, I think, uh, the, the certain qualities should be same. So what, 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 what are... Um, well, the secret to a good science fiction movie is, uh, is the research. So uh, most of the great uh, science fiction movies that have been out there uh, have been based on actual academic uh, research from uh, either NASA, uh, Silicon Valley, and in India, uh, based on uh, the actual workings of ISRO. Um, these institutions uh, plan uh, decades ahead. <clears throat> and um, in some cases, even more. In some cases, uh, um, for example, the great uh, Lumiere brothers film about the man going to the moon um, was based on um, on the work of philosophers and scientists of that time who were already theorizing about the potential of, you know, something maybe going to the moon someday and that that would actually be possible and if it would be possible, how? So that prophetic qualities of films uh, are based on actual things that are happening or being developed. And the film is kind of a visual presentation of that happening in real life. And um, that's why many of the thing, many of the films, uh, science fiction films that have been made in the past decades are now becoming, you know, more real 
than uh, than we could imagine. But that's because the actual um, the actual likelihood of those things happening was actually pretty pretty big. Um, so the way technology is now um, you know dominating our lives almost um, that was already decided a long time ago, and those uh, systems were already decide, designed a long time ago. Uh, the internet is much older than people think. It was first uh, used for military. But if you were a documentary filmmaker who was on uh, their profession at that time, or a director who was on their profession at that time, looking for a new subject, um, and you knew where to go, and you knew the right people to talk to, then they would tell you like, yeah, we're working on a thing called the internet. And one day everybody will be able to do video calls on Zoom or whichever program. And now it may seem weird, but this is our thesis. And then they would show the filmmaker, you know, like uh, Stanley Kubrick, for example, had uh, strong ties with NASA and now, um, um, Christopher Nolan also has strong ties with uh, NASA uh, because of Interstellar. So he was on the spot where the future things uh, were being developed. And he had a complete mood board of uh, documents that he could base his script on. And the only thing that uh, th these directors have to do to make it a good science fiction movie is to follow the human experience of being in a spaceship or being alone on Mars, like that Matt Damon movie, like how would that be as a human being? So that emotional journey of overcoming challenges uh, and uh, yeah, following the hero's journey in those films, uh, that makes it uh, a great science fiction movie backed up by actual science, actual things that are being worked on and that being the backdrop of what these people are experiencing. And, um, and uh, yeah, that has been done very well, for example, in the film called AI, where the robot uh, has become more human than actual humans. Um, and those things are very, uh, very, uh, very interesting um, philosophical questions that come up as you're researching, um, uh, you know, new uh, new science. Like, what consequences will this have for society? And those questions, with uh, the the identification of a of a human being experiencing those questions in the film, make make a great relevant science fiction movie in my opinion so now uh, coming back to uh, your work and uh, the current uh, situation like if i want to make a film or a science documentary or a science film now i had come uh, i had find my subject i had researched in it and i had an idea how to do it now, what will be my next step? What kind of uh, equipment do I need? Uh, the, the, the same question which I asked you earlier that do I need uh, costly equipment because most of the people who wanted to be a filmmaker or a, a film student who wants to uh, take uh, this as a career, they cannot afford that kind of equipment, that kind of money which the big filmmakers are having. So can you tell our viewers that what kind of equipment, what kind of thing they can go for and come up with the, uh, the great quality of film. Uh, not only the equipment, but also when we talk about after shooting, the editing and all these things, because there are so many free stuffs are also available. Is it good to use free editing stuff or should they go for uh, the costly one? All these so many questions which are there uh, in the mind of a film student or a film aspirant who want to make a film or a scientist who want to make a film on his work. Um, get free editing stuff. That's it. Uh, not going to advocate piracy here, <laughs> but I am saying do whatever you can 
to uh, achieve your dreams in a way uh, that is um, possible and realistic for yourself in that moment. So I can even take it a step further. Um, I was locked down in Himachal, okay? And at some point it was taking so long that I kind of really got that itch of, I want to do something again. I want to create again. So what do I have now to create a new project? I have a laptop and I can make a film about myself, an autobiographical film using video calls, recorded video calls with people from my past telling things about my personality, my behavior and my life story. So my first film was a film based on a mobile, uh, shot on a mobile phone. And the second film was an autobiographical film using video calls recorded on a laptop. And then it's not a finished product uh, project yet. Uh, and some of the video call quality is not good enough. So I will have to probably reshoot it. Uh, parts of it but yes that is possible so and you can shoot a film on a mobile phone and you can shoot a film using a laptop using a webcam and the only thing you have to do again so my plan with that uh, laptop film <laughs> is uh, to add beautiful music nice uh, you know old pictures and then it gets that cinematic feel again and of course you can see that they're video calls but that doesn't matter because the content and the music still drags you in as you are experiencing a, a real film a real story about someone so I made it even smaller than with the mobile film because I made it uh, independent of location so I didn't need to shoot on multiple locations, which is the biggest hassle. Uh, when I'm, it comes I'm to just uh, um, disturbing you again. Uh, one thing you talk about music. So I just wanted to uh, talk about it a little because this what the time from last these two months when we are doing the online film festival, what is one of the biggest problem for the film festival organization like us is that the filmmakers are not using the original music so whenever we want to show it online uh, it says that copyright problem and 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 sometimes it's blocked the film or or, or or block the film on certain region so if i go if i'm an independent filmmaker i'm making a film and certainly film the music is extremely important for the flow of the film if i go and I use some pre-recorded music of someone, which earlier uh, people used to do, then I cannot show it in the changing scenario because the, the YouTube or the other uh, uh, will not allow me to new music. It will be, I cannot do it because I don't have that kind of budget. So what you will suggest to the filmmakers that what to do with the music and how to uh, how to choose and from where to choose so, so that it it is not infringing any copyright uh, copyright thing use twitch so again twitch. Yeah. Twitch, twitch is a website so again twitch uh, is a company that understood that live streaming was going to be the norm and it specialized initially in live streaming gaming. But what it soon discovered was that music was one of the carrying and most memorable, obviously, factors of gaming. Because you hear the same songs in a video game, you know. And for artists, being in a video game was a very big a uh, big driving factor for their careers most of the time. 
So what started happening was that artists, independent artists started plugging their music, which is non-diegetic music. So it's just a person playing a video game, having uh, his or her Spotify on as they're video gaming of that independent artist music while they're playing the video game. And as people were watching how this amazing game player would be playing their video game, they would be hearing on all these different channels, the latest independent good music that was out there because Twitch relies on that economy. You know, that is their economy. It is about um, promoting new talent. So they don't have any copyright infringements because so, most of the time it's... So if I go to Twitch and I, uh, they had the, uh, they can uh, let me download the music. Yes. So you see the artist. So in the uh, description, the artist uh, of uh, that's playing in the live stream, mm -hmm. because I could also just put on music right now. Mm -hmm. Like I could just have like a soft music right now. And then, uh, you know, uh, Mr. Das would uh, ask me, wow, he's playing really nice music in the background. Who's that new artist? And then I would mm -hmm. just tell him here, and then I would be promoting that artist by default. But I could also <clears throat> have a film playing on Twitch, so live streaming that film, and Twitch would just allow it. Because they so know people can go to Twitch, that. they can download music from there, and they can use this music in their documentary or short film, and it won't be a copyright violation of any kind. No, no, because the you can contact the artist from that description, you know, so you know who to contact. But as a film festival, you can also show your films there without these copyright issues. Um, because the reality is that Facebook, you know, has kind of underestimated the way people use content. And um, they're such a big company. Uh, let me type it here. Yes. So it's uh, twitch.com, uh, friends, yeah. T-W-I-T-C-H.com. Yeah. Yes. And um, so Facebook underestimated how content would be distributed and, uh, and uh, consumed. And then... You know, apps like uh, Snapchat and Twitch started coming up, um, which who basically in in the uh, in the case of Snapchat designed stories. You know, Instagram and Facebook stories before they had thought about that, and uh, Twitch has uh, completely taken over the live streaming um, uh, market of the latest thing that's going on at that moment. And they knew that if they would restrict it, they would not be able to attract uh, the necessary crowd who, uh, who doesn't want that many complications. So Twitch is still, uh, still very much open to play music and uh, without uh, making any issues because SoundCloud, YouTube and Facebook uh, and also, I think um, um, Instagram, maybe. No, I think Instagram doesn't have it. But those three are definitely very complicated. And then TikTok came. And TikTok is also very reliant on music. So you can't uh, then, you know, restrict people from playing music. So actually, TikTok and Twitch are very good places to circumvent that uh, that issue. But as TikTok is banned in India, so Twitch is the place where we can go and probably uh, the Creative Commons music also can be used. So I will request all these yeah. filmmakers and inspiring filmmakers to kindly search for Creative Commons copyright free music be before using it into your film. Yeah. Because that creates a lot of problem for the festivals like us. 
Uh, now, as we have only half an hour left, so I'm 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 not going to disturb you again soon. So kindly uh, uh, let let us go back, and we were talking about the uh, the equipment which uh, anyone can use uh, for the filmmaking. So, if you are now uh, at home, uh, I suggest a laptop. Try to see. Uh, what minimum subject? So I I chose as a subject, like a scientific subject. I chose myself. So I wanted to investigate and analyze myself through the perspectives of people who have experienced me in different phases in my life to create a kind of coherent uh, image of who I was in this world. So it's like an identity piece, but with a kind of scientific investigative approach uh, through the knowledge base of the people who know me best, who know the subject best, which are my family, friends, former colleagues, etc. Um, and yeah, a lot of people are probably uh, in the cities right now and they most likely have much better Wi-Fi connection than I had in the mountains. Um, so you have a microphone and you have a camera there and you can pretty much interview anybody you want. So um, let's say you want to make a documentary about um, farmers issues in India. You go sit in front of your laptop, you contact the people you believe are best equipped to speak about that topic. You interview them uh, in a video call mode. You can even decide whether you want to be in the frame or not. You just keep your sub, you just record your subject. And then after that, you edit all these perspectives and opinions or, um, you know, uh, science that these people speak about you edit it together with uh, downloaded uh, editing software you have that could be iMovie on Apple but you can also uh, download uh, Final Cut um, and then after that you start editing if you can't afford a composer which I uh, fortunately could um, uh, you take uh, royalty-free music, which you can download on YouTube, but also different websites. And as long as that music suits the emotional, um, uh, um, the emotional weight of whatever is being said or experienced in the film, it will it will work. Songs have been recycled and reused in many different ways and they've had different effects because of it. Different, the same song can have a completely different effect when it's used uh, in a different way than before. So don't underestimate um, the quality of uh, royalty-free uh, music. I think we have another Q&A. Yeah, so um, you can use uh, iMovie or you can download um, older versions of Premiere. But listen, I have to go to the washroom really bad because I've been drinking coffee. So I'm going to take a one minute washroom break. You're muted. So uh, why don't you, uh, in the meantime, why don't you play something, uh, some uh, film of yours so that... Yeah. Uh, in the meantime, I will do that. Yes. I will do the... I'll do a scene from the fourth... Uh, yeah, so when you share the screen, please do tick share sound and optimize for video clips yes. so that I will do that.
One yes. second. Mm. Yeah, this one. Hmm, where is it now? Yeah. Is it sharing? Yes, it is. Our system, which we have inherited from the British, spreads responsibility too much and doesn't leave people the opportunity to have the authority, the budgetary control, and the decision-making capacity to actually get anything done. Until 2035, 17 out of the 20 fastest growing cities in the world will be located in India. Some of these cities will have larger populations than most countries. But how do you effectively govern these settlements? In this episode, we explore ideas of urban governance and how India can transit into more autonomous cities run for and by the citizens. The reason that the, the bill matters, it seems to me, is because uh, we don't have enough executive authority down at the um, grassroots level. So whether it's a village council, whether it's a city or a town, and for that matter, whether it's a state uh, government or a central government, I'm very much in favor of directly elected people who are accountable to their voters. We are all driven by the vision of Gandhi. Gandhi had a vision of village republics, where he understood what it was about, governing a village and he made a distinction between representative democracy and participatory democracy where he argued and rightly so something I believe in that it was the voice of the majority that needed to be listened to and not of representatives of the voice of the majority and that you needed to have therefore an ability that you could listen to people and act and people's and that democracy in the true senses. Now Clearly, in the new India, which is more, it's more populated, it's also more diverse, it's also more casteist, it has lots of layers in it. How do you create that democratic framework in which the voice of the weakest is listened to? Devolution of powers in India is not new. Devolution of powers to rural areas, we look at Panchayati Raj, started many decades ago. And that has worked to a large extent. Uh, where essentially you cut through the bureaucracy, red tapism, different governments and go directly from the center to the local panchayats or villages. I personally believe the same should be followed in urban areas. It should be made almost mandatory. Um, and some state governments have that, some states don't. In a state like Tamil Nadu, they have a direct elected mayor concept. So if you go to China, you're a businessman, you want to start a factory, you meet the mayor. The mayor has the capacity to say yes, to grant you the license for the product you want to make, to unlock the land, give you the um, electricity connection, the water connection, we help you hire the workers, and even what wages they need to and the route to your market or to your port where you want to get the goods out. 
that's obviously too much. But the fact that one person has all this authority means that the decision uh, for the businessman is very much easier. Whereas in India, you go to the mayor, you find he's a glorified chairman of a committee, uh, and nobody on the committee has the power either. And they go around in circles, and various influences have to be brought and bear in various areas. And finally, uh, the actual uh, budget will be signed off by an unelected bureaucratic official called the municipal commissioner. All of these things are, 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 are uh, privileging inefficiency in our local government. Our municipal commissioner would never go around the city and say, hey, that new shop is built in the road set back. Ward officer, why haven't you reported this? You would never do that. He doesn't want to upset the guy who owns the, the legal shop. Or the guy who owns the legal shop may, may own 20 legal shops. And maybe his elected representative in the municipal government, some a young municipal commissioner, does not want to run the vote and start challenging the, the powers that be in his city. He's going to be transferred into another job in three years now, and preferably a higher job, and a higher job, and a higher job. So he's never going to be a leader. Now, the mayor of the city in the Indian context is irrelevant. It is the chief minister of the state who calls the shots, or the city minister. The state government is in charge of the local government, and that's a big part of our dysfunctional governance system. We need to have mayors in charge of our cities. We need to give more power to our cities and an empowered mayor. We have rosy notions about London and New York, but our mayors don't have those kind of powers at all. And the state government is loath to give that. So we need to break that, and that's going to take time because there is no incentive for the state government to let go of their powers. There's always going to be a, um, a mismatch between the, the city and the state. And even in Mumbai or in Bangalore or in any other city, the state would want control. And it's not necessarily just about funds and resources. It's also about political control. When you uh, have party politics coming into this, more than a person representing their constituency, they're representing the party. And that's when you start having humongous discrepancies in decision making at the local level. Because I don't see how uh, like a party will know what the people want all the time. Right? They will know in certain situations. But all the time, you need a system that is informing them all the time. You need a system that's monitoring the situation all the time. You need a system where I, as a citizen, because I've paid my taxes and because I love this space that I live, it's my city, it's my home, right? Which I'm protective about, which I should be, right? I should be given the ability to even suggest policy. Even if all 30 of the 30,000 people in my ward met and said, look, we want the money spent on this park here, all 30,000, the way the law is structured, if the corporator elected by us says, sorry, I refuse to spend the money on the ward, it doesn't get spent. So we have a law which has lip sympathy for citizen participation, but gives veto power to the corporator. So we need to unlock this. We need to actually reframe these constructs where the voice of the citizen, it's a quasi referendum if I can call it that, can overturn what the corporator wants to do. In order to influence urban policy, the citizen requires tangible evidence. In Pune, a new app called iNagrik does exactly that. By reporting and documenting urban surroundings with the app, the citizens gather peer-reviewed data to give insight to urban planners and the municipal corporation to see where changes and improvements can be made. With Indian cities growing at a rapid speed, the support of the citizens can lead to progressive and democratic decision making. We have a population explosion where I don't think the government has the capacity to keep up uh, with, with whatever impacts that are taking place. You know, uh, because uh, if Pune was a million, I think 20 years ago, and now it's suddenly like 5 million almost. Okay, so in, in 20 years, it's like one five times, right? And uh, I don't think the departments like upgraded or like brought in enough manpower to meet that five time uh, increase in the population. This whole material is built to, to get the children on board. 
Actually, Siddharth has done a brilliant piece of work. That is, he's saying he's getting the children to observe the reality and to document it and to report it. Actively, there's about 500 children, uh, but about 5,000 have been uh, trained. Citizens who keep taking care of the city uh, will be more proud of the city. And if they're more proud of the city, they'll be more proud of their country. You know, and they'll contribute better. Pune is highly unwalkable in some parts. And it is highly walkable in some other parts. Based on the data that we got, and I think we got something like 500 inputs on walkability from around the city. One is that the road has no footpath. And the side of the road is... Uh, blocked by parked vehicles, uh, seems to be like the biggest problem, like 37.36% reports uh, came about vehicles that are parked on the side of the road that are blocking pedestrians from you know, making any progress. So I think we walked about 300 meters and we've had like maybe two or one obstacle, which is great. If you look at that, this one, a foot deep. Like that's a, see that? That's dangerous. If we create this evidence, hello, Juan, are you back? The public, then you can push it into public. So that's the whole exercise for yeah. citizens that they keep creating evidence. Yeah. So, uh, uh, yeah. So as we are, uh, we are only ten minutes left in our hand. Yeah. So. Uh, if anyone want to ask anything, uh, any question, please write it down here. So I do have a few questions uh, that I want to ask. Like, uh, it's from uh, a very good afternoon to you, sir. This is Shirin from Firozpur, Punjab. And Shirin wants to know what is your favorite film that doesn't use three-act structure and why did it work for you? So I want to understand what's three act structure first and then these films. So what is my favorite film that doesn't use a three act structure? Um, yeah, it's a, it's a difficult uh, question um, because um, I like thematic movies most. So movies that um, follow a theme more than uh, a three act structure. Um, I think that um, Man Bites Dog, uh, it's, a, it's a Belgian uh, film, it's a Belgian documentary. Um, follows um, basically documents a man's life as he goes on his you know per particularly and peculiarly peculiar business on a day to day and because uh, that man is, uh, is a very interesting and uh, in some way also flamboyant character, you're so engaged that, um, that you just keep watching and you don't really uh, care about him, you know, saving the world or, you know, solving a very complex problem. So I think that, um, that when, the, when the subject is, is, is engaging and, and, and fascinating enough, it can it can definitely overcome uh, three act structure. So I would say, uh, man bites dog. Yeah. The another question is uh, from Mister A G A one to you, sir. Uh, okay, no, it's it's from you only. The YouTube royalty free music they can use. So are there certain YouTube uh, music which are royalty free? How can they find it there? How they will go and find this royalty free music on YouTube? Uh, 
Yeah, so I replied uh, to start with the, with the YouTube royalty-free music. And they have a very big uh, library there. Mm. And um, otherwise, um, let me check for uh, Indian music, for example. Um, Yeah, I think premium beat. Um, premium beat. Uh, but it requires a but it requires a membership, a paid membership. But they have a big uh, collection of Indian uh, royalty free uh, music as well but if you look at the price of uh, having a composer uh, compose an original score uh, um, as opposed to uh, buying that I think uh, 10 or 12 dollars uh, membership then uh, you have a big then you've gained a lot of ground Yeah, you are correct. Like if uh, I can get a good quality of music in, in le less than uh, one percent of uh, the expenditure, yeah. that will be a good idea. Yeah, for ten dollars, if you get a library for ten dollars, um, with which you can score your whole film, then you know you've won big time. <laughs> yeah, it's like 600, 700 rupees uh, paying uh, and then getting a big library. Yeah, very good. Exactly. Nice idea. Uh, uh, one another question which I have received is uh, from Isha Parilkar. And she wanted to ask, can you please share the links? Uh, okay, uh, uh, Isha, can you please... Uh, can you suggest some free and good video editing software? Uh, I and think then, you replied to that uh, question earlier. Yeah. And then uh, okay. one uh, from KM uh, Serene again. Are there not? Uh, no, I was okay. not able to. Oh, can you please write it down here? All panelists only. Uh, I thought yes. that that was all panelists and attend attendees. Yeah. Um, Attendees and panelists. Yeah. Then um, let me now put those. So we have twitch.com for um, uh, circumventing copyright issues then premium beat and YouTube royalty free and um, We have a question about uh, camera for video-based sports motion capture. Yes, yes. Um, that would basically be um, for sports motion capture. I suggest a wide lens. On a DSLR camera that can record from 50 to 100 frames per second. 
so that you can capture uh, all the motion. Uh, when can you also suggest some of the free softwares which are there for editing available freely? That I, that was the other one. iMovie and you can download uh, an older version of Premiere. And there are also um, apps uh, to edit uh, to edit films, but um, I don't really use those. So you would have to look through your um, uh, Android uh, Google Play Store because I have an iPhone and there's less uh, availability there. But on Android, you have a lot of free editing apps. And if uh, you have to pay, it's it's only like uh, a few dollars. So it's like for two two dollars or something, uh, you can buy editing software on, uh, on a mobile phone. Because Final Cut Pro, if you had to buy it, it's like, uh, you know, a couple of hundred dollars. So don't underestimate uh, editing on your phone. There are very good apps out there in the Google Play Store. You just have to check the reviews because I don't use Android. But I know a lot of people that do. Okay, uh, so any specific Android uh, software, Android based software, do you want to mention it here? Yeah, I'll type it one second. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I've used InShot. It's available on. Uh... Video. editing Apps. Very easy to use and they have all the. All the settings uh, that are required to get a quality product uh, out there. Uh, thank you, Avan. Do. Yeah, so uh, as we are uh, out of time, so before we conclude the session, I will also request you to write down your YouTube channel so that uh, the viewers can go and watch whatever uh, films yeah. you have posted there. So if you want to, um, if you want to watch the episodes that uh, that I shared the uh, uh, clips of, mm -hmm. you can go to this link and please subscribe because more content will be available please like subscribe and share because I just put them on there. So uh, we want more people to, uh, to watch them. One hand raised from Mustafa. Mustafa, you can write down your question here so that quickly we can answer. I use uh, color correction and I use uh, Da Vinci or Final Cut Pro for simple color correction. And you can, uh, you can find really good free tutorials on YouTube to get you started. Okay. So uh, this was a session with uh, uh, 
Mr. E. G. Vandar, and uh, if I'm pronouncing, you can call uh, me Andreas. Everyone, Andreas. Can call me Andreas. okay. So yes, Andreas, it was a wonderful session with you, where where we learned so much, and thank you for uh, you know sharing so many links with the filmmakers and with us also because. as a film festival we are also facing so many problems when it comes regarding the music which we want to show so we have to um, exclude some of the films because of this uh, copyright issues yeah it's very so, sad yeah yeah so the, uh, do, uh, some of the films are really good film which we wanted to share but due to this copyright claim it's difficult for us to do though uh, so once again uh andreas thank you uh thanks a lot for taking uh, your time and uh, joining for this master class and uh, thank you all the attendees for uh, going through the master class so patiently and before uh, concluding the session i uh, wanted to uh, inform you once again that uh, in the evening we are having two another master classes uh, from uh, 3:30 uh, we will have a uh, master class by the german swiss filmmaker and the president of elephant in not elephant in need uh, from switzerland uh, miss brigitte uh, konanski and she will be uh, talking with us regarding science filmmaking is your passion provoke the change because uh, one thing uh, that is sure and uh, andreas is also nodding his head that without passion you cannot make films so making a film passion is at most important so you have to search out your passion so miss uh, brigitte will be talking about this passion and how the passion can provoke the change so please do join us here only this very link at 5:30 and then from uh, 5 uh, 3:30 and then from 5 o'clock we had another wonderful master class with the national award winner filmmaker uh, miss arthi srivastava uh, she will be joining us from uh, mumbai and chennai uh, and she will be talking uh, with us regarding the science filmmaking and the storytelling so she will be talking uh, in detail about the art of storytelling uh, so thank you again andreas uh, for thank becoming you. part of this master class and thank you everyone and we look forward to have you in the evening classes and uh, uh, another classes also thank you have a good day anytime good luck with everything and yes. uh, thank you diksha sonar for uh, subscribing <laughs> <laughs> and uh, i wish all of you uh, all the best and uh, stay safe out there and i hope to see you next time bye <laughs>